the um, Performance Compensation and Talent Management Committee to order. And um, first order of business is roll call. Teresa Taylor. Here. Irena Ortega. Here. Rob Fechner. Good afternoon. Matthew Saha for Fiona Ma. Here. Lisa Middleton. Present. Stacy Oliveras. She's here somewhere. She's here. And Mona Pascal Rogers. Here. Is that it? Okay. Thank, <laughs> Thank you. Um, our first agenda item is approval of the November 19th, 2019 performance compensation uh, talent management timed meeting. Um, what's the, uh, so moved by Ms. Pascual Rogers. I need a second. Second. Second by uh, Ms. Ortega. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. All those opposed? All right, motion carries. I'm on the executive report, Mr. Hoffner. Good afternoon, Doug Hoffner, CalPERS team member. Uh, we have three items before you today, uh, one action consent and two action items. Um, item 4B is an action item uh, related to the board's policy. This is really effectuating the changes that were uh, adopted by the committee in September, and we put those in a red line version for you if there's any questions. Um, in addition, we have item 6A, which we talked about a little bit in September as well. This is a request for a proposal for the board's independent incentive compensation consultants. And so this outlines a timeline with your approval that we would conduct um, that solicitation. We were looking for uh, basically a subcommittee of this committee to conduct that. There would be four members that would be modeling the process we used uh, five years ago, four and a half years ago when we conducted the last solicitation. Um, and the idea there is if you um, have any questions about that process, we can get into it in a minute. But that's um, the first action item. And item 6B is a presentation by McLoggan and Michael Oak, who is on the phone. Um, this is the presentation that was asked for by the committee chair related to pure comparison data related to the CEO position and salary uh, compensation within the board's um, peer group, which is identified in the policy. That's item 6B. Um, in addition, I'd like to recognize Renee Salazar, who's sitting behind me. She's in the Acting Human Resources Division Chief role and is serving, this is day two. So I, I didn't think it was appropriate to have Renee come up and make this presentation, but I did want to highlight and recognize her for her uh, contributions and leadership. Renee comes to us from the legal office and will be in this position while we do an active recruitment uh, to backfill the Human Resource Division Chief. Uh, with that, I just want to um, say thank you to the committee and happy to answer questions that you might have. That concludes my report. All right, seeing no questions, let's first take the action consent item of approval of the meeting minutes for um, September of 2019, 17th, 2019. I need a motion from the committee. Move Moved by Mr. Fechner, second by Ms. Oliveras. All those in favor of the motion, say aye. aye. All those opposed, motion carries. That moves us on to 4B, revision of board's compensation policy for executive and investment management <coughs> positions. Mr. Hoffner. So this is an action consent. I don't know if there's any questions. Um, again, this is the item essentially modifying the provisions that you adopted last in September, the last time we met. This incorporates the provisions, the long-term incentive plan for the investment officer positions, includes the deputy chief investment officer roles, and it's, it's basically running through that policy, all the changes that were adopted by this committee and board um, in September. And there's a red line version, so I can walk through the specifics. If there's any more details you'd like to see. No. Uh, I just got a move approval from Mr. Fechner, seconded by Ms. Pascal Rogers. All those in favor of the motion, say aye. aye. All those opposed? All right, motion carries on agenda item 4B. All right, and we are on five information consent items. Nothing's been pulled off, so we're going to move on to six action item, action agenda items 6A, proposal for the board's primary. Uh, executive and investment compensation consultant, scope of services, timeline, evaluation, subcommittee process. So, go ahead. Cool. Oh, Parm. 
Yeah, good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Parm DeHoot, CalPERS team member. At the September 2019 me meeting, the committee approved the initiation of the request for proposal for a primary compensation consultant. Today's item seeks the co committee's approval on the detailed scope of services, anticipated timeline, and the selection process. If approved as outlined, the committee chair will need to identify four committee members to act as the evaluation subcommittee. The chair may identify the subcommittee members through direct assignment, through a request for volunteers, or through another method that she deems necessary or appropriate. This can be done at today's meeting or following today's meeting. Based on the current estimated timeline, it's anticipated the subcommittee will meet in May of 2020 in a noticed open session meeting to review and evaluate proposals and select finalists who will then be interviewed by the subcommittee in a noticed open session meeting in June of 2020. It's anticipated the subcommittee will recommend a single finalist as the board's primary executive and investment compensation consultant for the full committee's approval at the June 2020 meeting. Thank you, members of the committee. If you have any questions at this time, I'd be happy to answer them. So I was, um, just informed that the president is the one that establishes subcommittees. So I'll make recommendations to the president and then he can um, establish the subcommittee. Okay. So, and that was an action item, so I don't think we can do an action item on that because only the president can do that. So I think what we're looking for is maybe the the scope of services that are attached here in attachment one. To accept the scope to of services. To accept the scope of services. This is basically consistent with the scope of service you have to date. In addition, we provided an added some language related to training and educational components. It could be something that any uh, potential vendors might provide as an additional service um, to the committee and the board. Um, and following that, selection of the four, we would have this in process. That would allow the, the team to essentially go through the RFP uh, behind the scenes processes that we would need to conduct with our, our contracting unit okay. to get that ready for um, submitting and sending out to prospective vendors. Okay, so, oh, hey, Mr. Jones. Yeah, I Mr. just want to, I'm sorry. Yeah, I just want to indicate that uh, I uh, authorize the establishment of a subcommittee and with you being able to name the subcommittee members. Okay, thank you. So then we can move forward with that. Um, uh, does anybody have any questions on the actual scope of the work? Oh, you are, I'm sorry, Ms. Ortega. Doug, can you talk a little bit about the training that you said that's expanding the scope to the training? So we um, we didn't detail explicitly what that would look like, but okay. we did add it as a bullet component in case, you know, as we've been talking about onboarding and education and sort of the utilization of some third party independent entities that come provide additional information related to compensation what as we have with other. For the board or for staff? Uh, this would be for, for the, the board, board committee the board. and the okay. board. So this is really modeled after the, the different sessions we've been conducting with like the, this. Um, the um, CFA with the investment office, those kinds of things. So it would be, it would be an option, um, but that wasn't included in the prior solicitation material. And so we thought we'd be, be helpful to at least include that, particularly if we get into to other items that may be um, more specific to specific types of investment compensation or other unique areas that we want to help uh, reinforce or, or, or provide educational for. So it's really more of an optional component. Okay, thanks. Okay, so um, we have been authorized to um, set up the subcommittee. I have some names I will email you guys um, and ask for your participation. At the same time, it looks like we are also accepting the scope of the um, a timeline and evaluation process. So I need to get a motion for accepting uh, agenda item 6A. Anybody? All right. Second by, okay, moved by Ms. Pasquale Rogers, second by Mr. Fechner. All those in favor of accepting uh, agenda item 6A, please say aye. 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 All right, all those opposed? All right, uh, item passes. We are moving on to I, uh, agenda item 6B, market compensation data and recommendations for the chief executive officer position. And this is also an action item. That is correct. So um, 
Good afternoon once again, uh, Parm Duke CalPERS team member. Agenda item 6B is being presented today as a result of direction received from the committee at the September 2019 meeting to bring back compensation data for the chief executive officer position based on the peer group defined in the board's compensation policy for executive and investment management positions. CalPERS engaged McLaughlin to gather data and in a moment we'll turn it over to Michael Oak who's on the phone with us today to present their findings including how total cash for the CalPERS CEO position compares to our peer group. McLaughlin provided similar data back in 2015 for executives and investment management positions, and this is kind of similar to what they did last time. The CEO is one of two remaining covered positions for which the compensation has not yet been revised to align with market data and in accordance with the pay philosophy adopted by the board over the last 18 months for other, other covered positions. Following Michael Oak's uh, presentation, you'll hear from Eric Mishka of Grant Thornton, who's sitting behind me, and he's going to be talking to you guys about the board's um, as the board's primary executive compensation consultant. Mr. Mishka will present Grant Thornton's recommendations for aligning compensation for the CalPERS CEO position with the comparator group and the board's pay philosophy. As you listen to the presentation, please consider the recommendations you're, and encourage, you're encouraged to focus on the CalPERS CEO position itself and whether you feel the revisions are necessary to align total compensation with the comparator group and pay philosophy. This is not a discussion about the current incumbent and not part of the annual performance evaluation process that we just went through back in September, as you guys are well aware. Any decision made today will become effective July 1 and incorporated into the policy at that time unless otherwise directed by the committee. And at this time, I'd be happy to answer any questions. If we don't have any questions, we can hand it off to Michael. Oak to yes, go ahead. It looks like okay. I have no questions from the committee. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thanks. I'm sorry I couldn't get in person today. That is okay. Thank you for being with us on the phone. Um, so the uh, hopefully this can be short and sweet, but um, at least from our initial um, presentation. But please do jump in and ask questions if you need any clarity or um, have any questions on the data or or um, the methodology. So on page two of the attachment, it's uh Attachment one and item six B, page two has the high level summary of where your current um, CalPERS midpoint falls versus the market. And we've showed you the market three ways. Uh, the first is the combined peer. So this is the peer group that you're normally establishing your, your compensation against. Um, and as we have in the past, as uh, some of the committee members have found it helpful, we've also bifurcated the data from that combined peer into um, public peers by themselves and then private sector peers by themselves. So from a base salary perspective, the CalPERS midpoint is below the 25th percentile. So in other words, it's, it's uh, low versus market across all peer groups. When we factor in uh, incentives paid at target for the CalPERS, so it'd be the CalPERS salary at midpoint plus target incentives, CalPERS is below the 25th percentile for both the combined peer group and the private sector and falls between the 25th and 50th for the public peers. And then if we were to look at the maximum incentive, so this would be salary plus all possible incentives earned, the combined peer group, you would more or less be at the competitive 25th percentile for the combined peer group. From public peers, you'd be between the 25th and 50th, and uh, for private sector, below the 25th. And, and we show this in more detail in the, other, the next pages, but the short of it is you can kind of visually see there and read is that you're below the 25th uh, for most uh, of these analyses. So moving on to the next page. This is the actual data. So for example, the first two set of bars, the first blue bar is CalPERS, and this is the base salary only. The minimum is 224, the midpoint is 288, and the maximum is 353. So the, the white thick bar um, that separates the two blue points is the midpoint, and then the bar on the top and bottom represents the min and the max. This compares to the market salary midpoint of 437, 25th percentile at 350, and 75th percentile at 503. 
So uh, a significant discount to the median um, and even below the 25th percentile. Moving on to the right, when we factor in target incentive compensation at CalPERS, that brings the midpoint up to 366 uh, versus the median of 712. Uh, and again, the 366 is below the 396 25th percentile. And then if we factor in maximum incentive compensation, that brings CalPERS midpoint up to 404, which is why the earlier set approximates the 25th percentile of 396, so statistically insignificant difference there uh, between the 404 and the 396. All clear so far? Mm -hmm. any so I don't have any questions. Pages, was that a question? No, I don't have any questions. Go ahead. Okay, good. So the next, um, the next two pages are the same format. Um, except one is the public sector, which is page uh, four of nine. Um, and again here, this is the um, uh, US, just as a reminder, they're listed in the back, but this is US and Canadian public pension funds, uh, as well as select California-based agencies. So we kind of went through the positioning before, um, salary below the 25th percentile, salary plus target between the 25th and median, and uh, similar positioning, salary plus maximum uh, is coming up below median, but above the 25th percentile. And on to the next page, which is the private sector data. Um, the bars get a little bit um, squished and hard to see because the magnitude of difference. Um, but again, so you have transparency into what's being included. The CalPERS salary is below the 25th percentile um, and then well below the 25th percentile by, by multiples um, when factoring in incentive compensation. And that, that, that's it, that's the data. So it's kind of straightforward and, and factual, but um, if you have questions, I'm happy to answer them. Do you have any questions from the committee? Ms. Pascal Rogers. Yes, thank you for the information. Um, sorry if I sound like I'm confused. There's a lot of numbers here. Uh, uh, did we? Was there something? Was this done when during the when the job offer was made? Did we do a salary survey like this to see where other um, other like pensions or and you know operations uh, businesses? How they compensated. I mean, I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of. Why did we get to the percentile that we're at? Is yeah, what I'm so trying the, to figure out. You no, know, I, I think I understand your question. So the last time we conducted a salary survey that covered this position using the McLaughlin firm was back in 2015. Okay. Um, the last modification occurred, and that was basically, I think, excuse me, I think it was from 2014 data. It was modified with a five percent increase in 2015, but it didn't really elongate the overall salary um, uh, range at that point. So typically these are done every couple years and at one point we're kind of alternating between the investment office and the executive office going back from 2012-2013. Um, there was not a salary uh, survey conducted um, when the CEO position was uh, vacant in, in early or at least announced to be uh, that the former incumbent was retiring in 2016. That was not conducted then. Okay. Well, Thank you. Okay. Ms. Middleton. Uh, this is for the consultant. Did you come to any overall conclusion regarding uh, the comparative uh, salary that our CEO is receiving? Uh, I'm not sure I understand the question. Uh, do you believe our CEO is overpaid, underpaid, or appropriately paid? Yeah, so that's, um, I, I think that um, you have, you all have spent a considerable amount of time establishing a compensation philosophy, reviewing and refining peer groups, um, and, and adopting that philosophy in peer groups that represent or are intended to represent the labor market that you would recruit from and lose talent to. So my observation is you have, you've spent a lot of energy, effort, time, 
uh, quite frankly, money on expensive consultants like myself refining these things. Um, and the positioning that you're at is uh, well below market. So my my observation is that you are below market across all of these peer groups you're looking at, including public and private sector organizations. Um, and, and I think that, that these do represent a, a good comparison. Um, and over the years, a lot of time and energy you'll spend refining this peer group and refining your pay philosophy. So, um, uh, and, and perhaps it's a better question for Grant Thornton as your primary comp consultant, but my observation, having worked with you all for many years, is that uh, this position in particular has not uh, has not been addressed, the deficit of market. The positioning is not new of, of how you fall versus market. The last time we presented data to you, it was uh, equally below market. And I believe at the time you chose not to address it because you had some other compensation uh, issues that you would be addressing going forward. So now I think is maybe the, the, the appropriate time um, to address the deficit, I guess is my, my opinion. Thank you. So... And I will uh, let everybody know that we do have the Grant Thornton uh, handout as well as in our attachment to. Um, I am moving on to Ms. Pasquale. I'm sorry, no, I'm uh, Ms. Paquin. Oh. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just had two questions. And one is I, I think that we um, gave the CEO a raise for this current fiscal year in September. So if we adopted a new range now, would that change? Or base salary for this year. You want to answer that, Perm? Thank you. Yeah, we're um, anticipating that if you made the recommendation to change something today, it would be effective um, this upcoming fiscal year. So fiscal so year July 19, 1, 2020. 2020. Yeah. Okay, and then the other question I had was under our po current policy, is any annual increase limited to 8% if the person in that position is at the bottom quartile? Going forward, um, based on the meeting in September, we actually aren't basing the increases on the quartiles anymore, um, and so for outstanding performance, but that's a performance discussion, and that's not what really this is about, but um, it would be 7% if, if there was outstanding performance. 7%, but yes. not 90%, mm -hmm. but that would be the max in any one year? Any any one year, yes, So uh, unless you decided to do something different. So, I mean, the board could set whatever salary range they wanted to today, but in practical terms then the increase is limited to 7% for next year. That is correct. Okay, thank you. I think, I think there's a miss, are you saying that if, if we set the salary for uh, July 1, 2020, and it's $200,000 higher, we're going to set the salary for $200,000 higher, but then going forward, her, uh, her salary increase can only be 7%. That, that is correct. She would go to the base of whatever salary you set if that salary is higher than her salary today. Yeah. Go. Oh, hold on. Let me find you. There you are. So I guess I'm just a little bit confused because I thought that the lower end of this range that we're looking at now, she's already, her base salary is already above that. Is that true? Just barely. So I was... So I was thinking maybe we should let uh, Grant Thornton yeah. present their letter. Or there's, there's three options they've identified. Maybe we can tease that out because there's we several got a bunch different of things too, depending so. upon which option that they've proposed. Mm -hmm. Some in term, include long-term incentive, one does not. So, I mean, there's, there's kind of a, a variety of things to look at, I guess. Okay, um, great. And if yeah. we, in that discussion, I, I guess I just want to know if you can answer that question at that point, where the base salary is starting from this new proposed range and how that impacts what a future base salary would be, given our 7% policy. So we've got a bunch of questions. So f um, first I'm going to, uh, Ms. Oliveras. I'll hold my questions. Until then, okay. And then Ms. Pascal, Ms. same? The same, thank you. And then uh, Ms. Ortega, you want to hold your question or? Yeah, i Okay, so I'm going to get rid of all of you. <laughs> <laughs> all right, go ahead. All right, thank you, uh, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Um, so we went through and provided a few recommendations. I sent you a, a memo outlining those, but our recommendations were based upon a, a few things. One, um, aligned with the CalPERS new policy. Sorry. 
Uh, so we based our um, recommendations on, on three items. The first being alignment with CalPERS' new compensation philosophy of targeting total cash compensation, or sorry, total compensation between the market 50th and 75th percentiles for total cash. And so what that means is for CalPERS, base salary, annual incentive, and if eligible, long-term incentive, an aggregate competitive with the market total cash between the 50th and 75th percentile, and that's just base salary and annual incentive for the market data. Next, you know, aligning, so then we look at the market data that McLaughlin pulled together. We looked at that and came up with the recommendations. And then lastly, we look, considered uh, positioning within CalPERS and comparable positions um, governed by the committee. Uh, so our three alternatives we provided to you include two Grant Thornton uh, recommendations and then one item or an option just for comparison or for f further consideration. Um, I'll, I'll turn to the memo, page three, as a table that kind of outlines our recommendations. It might be easier to follow that way. Um, but our first recommendation, option A, um, targets the base salary midpoint at the uh, market 50th percentile, and then we built a range that's plus or minus 25% from there. So, for example, the midpoint of McLaughlin's market data, the combined peer group, was 437,000. Uh, we then targeted that as the midpoint of the salary and built a range of $327,000 to $546,000. Uh, we increased the annual incentive target to 40% with a maximum of 60% opportunity, and then also including a long-term incentive that the um, investment office recently um, has part of their compensation program, which is equal to a targeted 40%, and it would be the same um, participation as the, long as the incentive office. So, if the actual incentive earned for one year was less than 40%, then the long-term incentive portion would just be that amount of actual annual incentive compensation earned. Uh, this would place the um, midpoint of salary, target annual incentive, and LTI slightly above the market 50th percentile for total cash, about 786,600 for our recommendation, and the market data of 712,000. And it put the maximum um, between the 70, 50th and 75th percentile, though well below the 75th percentile. Our second alternative um, is kind of follows the same process, though so we increase the base salary even higher to target the 75th percentile uh, of $503,000, and then built a range off of that. The annual incentive target would remain unchanged at 27%, with a maximum opportunity of 40, and again, adding in the long term incentive component of 27%. Uh, this would provide similar uh, mid-target annual incentive and LTI um, as their prior recommendation, again, slightly above the 50th percentile, and the maximum of about 1.05 million, which is, again, is far below the 75th percentile of the market. Our third alternative um, basically just is the same thing, though it does not provide for a long-term incentive component. Um, it targets the base salary at the market 75th percentile, and then increases annual incentive to 53% target with a maximum opportunity of 80%. Um, our, we feel that all three of these uh, provides a, a proper leverage between fixed compensation based salary and incentive compensation for performance between the annual and long-term incentive component for our recommendations. Um, we don't recommend option C just because in our mind it focuses too much attention on short-term performance and without having that long-term incentive component and you know, kind of balancing out annual and long-term uh, performance. So I'll pause there uh, if there's any questions. We also have a visual um, in our appendix that kind of shows this as a graph format as well. Great. So do I have questions from the committee now? I need you guys to light, light up again if you need to ask questions. Okay. Ms. Ortega? Yeah, a couple of things. Um, so I think just to be transparent about where I would come from on this issue, I don't generally agree with the comparator groups that bring in the private, the bankers, the insurance industry, the Canadian funds. Um, I think the public uh, comparisons make a lot more sense. That's, um, I, I asked for the detailed information on the California-based agencies. I think that's a more realistic um, pool of the type of candidates that uh, typically come into um, the pension funds. Um, however, when I look at those numbers, we're still seemingly significantly behind. Mm -hmm. So I, I um, where I think my um, 
perspective on this would normally lead me to not be supportive of making a change. I look at these um, salaries and I and I think we're considerably under and I can't uh, understand what the reason for that would be considering the complexity of um, the CalPERS system and some of the additional uh, responsibilities that our CEO has in comparison to some of these agencies when you consider um, the health uh, side of, of the CalPERS operation. Um, so I think it would be helpful. I don't... Um, I'll wait and see where everyone else is on this. I think it would be helpful to me to see that um, where where the median uh, ends up if we just looked at the California um, and see whether these uh, recommendations from Grant Thornton are still sort of on on par with where where I would see maybe we should go. But um, I, I'm not making that recommendation. I just think it would it would be helpful. Um, the other question, the, the question I would have about taking this type of action is how this might affect other executive team salaries and other salaries that the board has the authority to set. Um, I would very much be concerned if this was taken as a sign that we were going to adjust everyone else's salary to sort of catch up. Um, I, I don't think that that would be appropriate, although that is very much the way compensation works in, in the state. So um, I, I do want to raise that as uh, whether that's in fact what we would intend to do. And so that's one question. And my second question is on um, the Grant Thornton recommendation on the incentive options. I, I may have missed this, but um, in a previous discussion about the long-term incentive for the investment staff, we talked about how it was a potential that a long-term incentive proposal would come back for the CEO and other um, salaries that are in the board's authority. And so this would not be a long-term incentive, correct? Our, our recommendations do provide for a long-term incentive, so it would be having the CEO participate in that long-term incentive okay. program. And so if if you do adopt one of our recommendations, then the only remaining position would be the CIO, who is not participating in that long-term incentive program at this time. Okay. So we would suggest addressing that in, at a future meeting. As well as other executive positions covered outside the investment office to not have long-term incentives. So I just yeah. want to be clear there. Yeah, I, I guess but we have an option. Here. I would not want to revisit the CEO salary again in a few months to talk about a long-term incentive. So I just that's the reason for the clarification. So I will say that I was looking at other salaries in the investment office right now, and we have investment officers that make more than our CEO um, with their long-term incentive and such. So, um, and then I, I have no problem using uh, just the California-based. I think we should throw in Canada because they are a pension fund. Now, I don't know if they manage their pension in a private sector fashion and maybe that's why you're taking that into consideration um and finally i just wanted to reiterate i remember the conversation when we first looked at uh raising this and i think a lot of it surrounded the why should we pay, be paying more money it's a state job and i think that we need to get over that and move on and hopefully and it sounds like we have but i, I and hopefully that we are uh moving in the right direction to bring uh, compensation up to um, a standard and we could probably quickly get a comparison of is I'm just looking real quick am I missing stirs stirs is not here is that correct they're in the um, in the and not on that list. They're yeah, in the be, U.S. I mean, if we're going to the, include, they're inclu so, Madam Chair, they're included in the U.S. Pension Peer Group, which is different. On a, it's part of the, the the public pension side, which includes Canadian and U.S. funds, which is on uh, what slide are we on? Five or six? Yeah, it's included there. Okay. And so um, there's a breakout of that, and, and Michael Oak has done work for that system as well, so he could speak to that compensation as well as um, the differences between those. Um, peer comparator groups and plans that exist today, if that'd be helpful. And then I wanted to go back to um, Ms. Ortega's question. So uh, looking at the list of those that are covered by this policy that the board um, has authority over, all the positions minus the CEO and the chief actuary have had relatively recent modifications to compensation. Um, 
the CFO was about a year plus ago. The health director, chief operating officer was recently. The general counsel was two months ago. And then the deputy chief investment officer was two months ago. And then the rest are covered by the investment office plans that were adopted in February. So effectively, there's only two positions that within the covered policy group that haven't had a review since probably 2013, 14-ish time frame. So just for um, background. Okay, Ms. Oliveras. Uh, thank you. So I'd, I'd like to know what the compensation. I'm oh, sorry. Okay. Uh, what the base compensation and it, any incentive compensation is for STRS CEO? Yeah, I thought he was going to get it. So the current CEO salary um, is four hundred and seventy-four thousand nine hundred ninety-six. And um, their incentive ranges work a little bit differently now. They're making some changes over there. So they're at zero to 80 for fiscal year 18, 19. They're gonna go to zero to 115% for fiscal year 19, 20. And they're gonna go to zero to 150% for fiscal year 20, 21. And then on um, this comparison of California-based agencies, I'm, I don't understand why Lacerra is not on here. Unless there's listed on here, but this is not current compensation. So that was our understanding that they just filled that position last week or so. And so that was the data that we had available. I, mean, I think the recruitment range was like 500 to 550. Yeah. And there's looking at what the salary was that was that we could identify. So okay. as a week ago, we didn't even have this number because it was vacant. Okay. Right. So, so we had an is, unknown number. It's higher. It's yeah. They listed at 260 at one point and they said basically during the recruitment, it was unknown. So. They weren't advertising specifically what the full range was when the data was developed. Um, I want to understand how the comparative basis for the incentive compensation, because it's helpful to see the base salaries, but I don't see any comparative information for the incentive comp, at least with state agencies, beyond what's here for additional pay. Am I, am I missing something? No, many of them do not. Um, at least this is the subgroup. This is the California-based agencies was the group that the committee members about two years ago included in, a do, in addition to the U.S. and Canadian pension funds. Um, and so many of them, as you can see here, do not include incentive compensation other than state compensation insurance fund um, has some, some bonus as well as retention differential. The, the others tend not to. Um, and I think McLaughlin could speak to the pension side, both Canadian and U.S. They, they typically would. Yeah. What about UC Regents? They're on the pension fund side. So you, you didn't give us, I thought I asked yeah, you guys they, for those they, figures. They include incentive opportunities, at least on the investment side, and it's typically a higher, a higher threshold, we, threshold I, which is more like the zero to 150. Can I get the cash base and the incentive range, please? I'll see if I have that. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions, Ms. Oliver? No, thank you. Okay, thank you. Ms. Pascal Rogers. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, of all of the, the CEOs that you've listed on here, and even some that um, the consultants and the team made, how many are women? <clears throat> um, so Doug Hoffner, Calpers team member, we looked at the data set for the California-based agencies as well as the U.S. Canadian funds. Um, there are total of 22 entities listed there, and there's only one um, woman CEO in, in the Virginia retirement system. And then, uh, so there's only one in this comparator group here. Okay. Um, I don't know, maybe Michael O can speak to the number of entities that are in the, um, you know, the private sector financial side, but, but I don't know how any of them would be included there. So we, we don't collect gender within the compensation surveys, but I can tell you from um, other research that we do on uh, diversity that um, uh, women make up less than 5% of executives uh, in the industry. Which is a shame. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right. Ms. Middleton. Yes. Uh, these may be more excuse me, comments than questions, but uh, I certainly concur with uh, Ms. Ortega that we should be looking at public employment. Uh, I'm inclined to accept uh, 
uh, the Canadian public employment uh, as comparisons. Uh, but I'm looking very specifically at uh, the list of other CEOs here in California. And uh, I don't have personal knowledge of each and every one, but I do have some very distinct personal knowledge of a couple of these. And the complexity of the assignment that our CEO has to carry out uh, is uh, incomparably more complex uh, in terms of the depth of knowledge that is needed both of public sector and the financial sector uh, of our economy. And then multiply that by the political complexity of the assignment that we have given our CEO and add to that the critical nature of where we are as a fund. Uh, we have, I believe, one of the most difficult jobs in California public employment, and we are underpaying our CEO to do that job. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mr. Perez. Oh, man. You're up. Uh, so looking up, up the list of the California cities, including uh, the CalSTRS number that was given to us, it appears on base salary alone that the range or the rate is 357, 943. Did you do the average? Is that yeah. what you're saying? Yeah. So I will say, um, thank you, 357, which is the bottom of the range? The top, there's only two that uh, allow more range, and it's at the top of the range. LA Water and uh, SAC Uni. Okay. Um, I would also say that we need to include the pension funds because that those are our peers. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. uh, these these counties aren't our peers, um, so the pension funds aren't even included. These are, except for Lasers, which. Well, Sarah. Yeah, but there's not the big pension, the bigger pension funds. And I think if we're the largest pension fund in the country, we should be comparing ourselves to the larger pension funds. Yeah, I've been saying, I've been saying for a long time that we, you get what you pay for. Right. And it's not, it's not specific to our current CEO, but it's the office of the CEO for CalPERS. Right. Not that I don't have anything, you know. You, you right. know. I, I think, um, so here, what is the, uh, what does the committee want to do here? We've got an action item. Um, we've got three suggestions. Two by Grant Thornton, right? The other one was not one of your suggestions. Hold on. I'm looking for it now. There it is. So what is the um, committee's desire? Do I have a recommendation for any of this uh, option A, B, or C? I did, yes. Okay, so I got two people still on. I'm sorry, I haven't cut your mics yet. Okay. You guys want to talk or? Do we have the STRS information? Somebody can pull it up. Maybe yeah, so minutes. I think Par may have just said that. So you, the base range right now is 325 to 4, 475, with a current salary at 474,996, with an incentive range in the most recent fiscal year of 0 to 80%, for next year to be 0 to 115 and the year after that to be 0 to 150. And will that, is that base slated to change in the near future? So they had a workshop, as my understanding, on Thursday of last week and discussed in that workshop, um, looking at, I think, in the next 90 to 120 days, coming back with some recommendations and feedback related to compensation from a base salary perspective. The incentive opportunities were just most recently um, adopted by their board, I want to say this last year. So I think they're kind of doing um, sort of two steps at this. And then they also looked at another measure related to non-executive um, positions within the organization. So they had sort of two measures they were looking at. But I believe in the next you know quarter, they're essentially going to bring back some data from their incentive comp consultant to bring back some uh, recommendations as to what that might look like. So do we have current salary for the CEO? Yeah, 474000 Total salary. 
Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't. Um, total comp, yeah. Yeah, total compensation. Yeah, sorry, it's $805,316, um, which was approved last week. Last week? Yes, which includes right. the incentive as well. All right. Okay, Ms. Ortega? Yeah, I, I do want to caution against doing a complete comparison mm -hmm. to the CalSTRS salary because, and, and Michael is, I believe, their consultant as well, so he can speak to this better than I can, but I think they use a different comparator group. Mm -hmm. So um, I think our, um, the, the analysis we have is uh, drawn down a bit by the fact that we even include this California comparison group, the CalSTRS Comparative does group does not include that, so that draws us down compared to them. However, I, I would argue that that's a more appropriate way to look at our comparator. Um, I think the way they do it results in, um, in my opinion, a, a higher uh, comparison than is appropriate. So maybe Michael O can speak to that. They also have a weighting component to their peer comparator group that we do not have. So Michael, can you did you hear that last question related to sort of the differences yeah. between CalPERS and CalSTRS and their peer comparator group, though they look similar on the face? Maybe speak to a little bit about the differences, please. Sure. And just a caveat with, of course, you could have went to any meeting we've presented to. So everything I've been saying is public knowledge. Um, uh, their peer group is um, uh, combined of two groups. One is public funds. Their public fund group, however, is only looking at U.S. funds, whereas yours looks at U.S. and Canadian. And that has an explicit weighting of 67%. And the second component for their executive positions is private sector, which is a broad range of private sector firms, including investment advisory banks, insurance companies, endowments, foundations, corporate pension plans, um, that has an explicit weighting of 33%. Um, so the difference there would be your private sector group is only looking at banks and insurance companies, um, which would uh, pay less than the investment advisory firms that are included in, in the CalSTRS group. Um, and you also um, uh, look at an AUM-based group for the private sector. So you're, you exclude the really large firms and you exclude the really small firms whereas they have um, everybody into that bucket. So the market data does come out different. Um, so there are a number of differences there, as I just described, but the biggest difference and the biggest driver of why the two market data points might be a little bit different um, is, as, as uh, someone mentioned earlier, the use of the California-based agencies in your group does kind of pull the, um, the market data down a bit. However, I mean, as you can see there, as you just described, their pay data, the 805, 805,000 was the, was the last week's decision. Um, so the current maximum opportunity, if I did the math right, is about 855,000. Um, and the 1920 fiscal year, the maximum is just over a million dollars at 115%. Um, and when it does move to that 150%, assuming the base salary also doesn't change, that maximum for them would be um, just under 1.2 million. Wow. Okay, Ms. Pascal Rogers. Um, I'm going to pass for a minute. I got to think of that. Um, Ms. Middleton. Okay. Uh, I would like to offer this uh, perspective that uh, when we look at other California-based public entities, we're largely looking at base salary. Right. And. The more that we put into our incentive program, the more we are going to be back here uh, every year for very long and, con and difficult meetings on whether or not this incentive or that incentive should be approved. Uh, and I recommend that we do as much as we can within the base salary uh, and not follow uh, the CalSTRS model of having as much as 150% of base salary uh, that is in play. Uh, Agreed. So are you, are you suggesting, so we just did a whole revamp of our, our um, compensation. You aren't suggesting that we just don't do incentive at all. 
No. Okay. But <laughs> I, I am suggesting that we, uh, we build in a base that we feel very comfortable with uh, and that we feel is very responsible. And then there is an incentive over that. Uh, but that incentive should uh, be the tail, not the dog. Gotcha. Okay. And then Ms. Oliveris. I'd like to know the compensation for the, the UC Regent president. Mm -hmm. Jason, we'll try to find that in, in a minute, okay? Yeah. Okay. And then while someone's looking that up, I'm in their question. Is there any comparison for a CEO of public pension plus somebody who oversees health benefits? So both, right? Because there's the pension component and then there's benefits. Michael, do you want to try to answer that in terms of the Canadian and the other U.S. funds? I would say the majority of them do not include a health component, but you might have better data on that. Yeah, I'd, I'd say um, uh, I don't have fund by fund data on on who has that, but I would agree with your conclusion that most of them are are not going to have both of those functions under one roof. So, in other words, your job is is likely larger than the the other pension funds being included. So, have we looked at comp CEO compensation for health plans besides oh, uh, Cover bigger. California? We, we did, this is Doug Hoffman again, we did that when we looked at the chief health director position, and that wasn't for CEOs of those companies, though. That was for folks running um, those types of operations within a larger entity. Um, we didn't explicitly look at the CEOs of healthcare organizations at that time, and the board adopted that policy, um, it, you know, this in the last year in terms of compensation, but it wasn't geared towards specifically the CEO of healthcare. Yeah, I think this this role is unique in that it's a hybrid position, and I think the compensation should reflect that. Okay, um, I'm sorry, Mr. Perez. Yeah, with that, with the California uh, folks being included, we're we're at that number is her, is the average. Uh, and but that's not acceptable. She does exceptionally. That office does exceptionally more work and responsibility than those other entities. Uh, but I agree with uh, Ms. Middleton's uh, thoughts. Uh, if, if I was king, I would I would give her um, a large base and minimal incentives. So um, I'm going to go to Henry, and then I need to ask the committee some questions. Henry? Yeah, I thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Yes, I, I'm, I'm inclined to also support Ms. Milton's uh, thought, thought about the, making the base uh, the driver uh, of the compensation. And we talked about complexities. I mean, we only talked about some of the complexities. We only mentioned health care, but we also have long-term care. We also deal with 33,000 different agencies throughout the, the state. We also provide oversight, uh, as my understanding, the Social Security Administration for public agencies in this state. So when you add all these complexities, I think we need to be mindful of where we're going to set that base hour, and it should be up substantially. Okay, so we have three options. Um, I understand what Ms. Middleton is saying. I think that we had a um, kind of a, a decision point when we did the last compensation adjustment, which was to include the long term, to, to tie it to long term. Because I don't think in the news, even though our CEO is doing a fantabulous job and she's probably going to the legislature, if we were to have another recession, <clears throat> Um, or a mistake, right? It would probably be a bad thing in the news to be giving our CEO compensation that year. So if we're if we're not, you know, giving or long term incentive that year. So, but in really good years when we're making our our mark, shouldn't the CEO be tied to the long term compensation? So that's where I'm. I get. So the discussion I'm having with you guys as the committee is the option three cuts out the long-term incentive. Okay, option C, not three. 
the other two options that Grant Thornton are is the one recommending uh, has the annual incentive and the long term incentive, but um, we have midpoint salaries of four thirty seven and five hundred three for um, those two options plus. But we can get all the way to with option A. We can go, get all the way to 786, which would put us in kind of competition then at that point with the long-term salary. So we're actually giving them an annual incentive. So if they're doing a really excellent job, like everything's whatever it is, outstanding or excellent or whatever, um, so they get the target of 40 percent, and they get the long-term incentive because they made five years of 7% of 40%, then they're going to get the 786, but they're not going to get that unless all of that is consistent. So where, how, do, how does the committee want to fall on that? We don't have to do those. This is entirely up to the committee. One, yeah. One, yeah. Go one thing ahead. I'll add is you're talking about um, higher salary and, uh, you know, we consider that kind of leverage between fixed comp and variable compensation. And our option B, our second recommendation, you know, does target the salary of the 75th percentile and provides less compensation and incentives, both annually and long term um, to get to, you know, just above median for target and, you know, between median and 75th percentile for the maximum opportunity, um, whereas the first recommendation is more, I would say, competitive with the market median throughout. So it's got the 50th percentile base salary target plus um, incentives that would get to just above the market median. Um, so to, Ms. Middleton, to your, to your comment before, uh, option B, I think, would be aligned more with what you're thinking of, a higher salary and less in incentive programs. Okay, Ms. Uh, Pascal Rogers. So the long term, thank you, Madam Chair. The the long term target is it's forty percent. It's not it's not like the range zero to forty. It's forty percent. It's, it'll be the lesser of whatever the actual incentive that was paid for that year and forty okay. percent. So the target's forty, but it could be less depending on if actual incentives was less than that. But it won't be more than that for the initial year. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Ms. Oliveras, do we have an update on the UCs? Yes. Thank you. Uh, the president of the Regents is making $578,916 as of October 2017. Um, doesn't, doesn't show that there's any incentive up there. They are doing a recruitment as we know now, so I just talked to Mr. Uh, Cohen to see if we had any updates. So it sounds like there's a salary survey that's going to be in process, so we don't have that at the moment. Um, I did look at some of the other positions, um, all in the investment office that have incentive, um, and the and their CIO in this case was just under $700,000 um, in this last report. Um, they do include uh, chancellors of different universities that include healthcare facilities mm -hmm. as well, so they've broken those out differently for those that have healthcare uh, hospitals and those that do not. Um, and so. The chancellor of, let's say, a UCD, UCI, UCLA, or UC Riverside are all within the, let's say, 430 to $525,000 uh, kind of range right now. Um, and then if you get to a chancellor of one of those universities that is not um, having a hospital, um, those system costs come down. Um, but if you get to the executive of the hospital, in this case, the CEO of UCLA Hospital is earning just over a million dollars. That's um, why our hospital costs are so high. I'm and sorry. others within UCSF is 1.47. Um, the CEO of UCSD is 934,000. And the interim CEO of UC Davis Hospital is $753,984. And so what's the structure of their incentive compensation? This doesn't show incentive. This is just showing straight up, um, looks like base, base salary. So this, the data I'm looking at from the document from their governance committee doesn't show an incentive uh, provision within this document. And can we briefly review the performance requirements or targets for the annual incentive? What, what the components exists, of that? Of what exists today? Uh, is Yes. And then is anything different proposed? There are, aren't different proposed changes at the moment within the, the policy. Um, okay, so, so the components would be the same. Yeah, they are existing ex it's the same today. With they're, they're baked into the existing policy. And then just another clarification on LTI, that's after five years? Is that right? Or? 
Correct. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, Mr. Perez. Uh, I'm glad I'm not on this committee, but to add insult to injury, uh, consider the retirement benefits that other pensions have. Uh, like Cal Sturz is classic. The CEO there is classic. Uh, whereas our current CEO is, is Pepra. Pepra. Yeah. Yeah, so she's had her, yeah. That's a good thought. Didn't think of that. Mr. Miller. Just a, a couple general thoughts. I, I really am very much in line with Ms. Middleton's comment that um, given the complexity, given the almost uniqueness of this, and certainly when you look at almost any of our comparator groups, I would want to see our CEO compensated in a way that puts them you know, solidly above median performance, uh, median compensation levels, and I would want them to be have relatively little exposure to the long-term incentive, given the, the tenure and duration of these positions, our ability to recruit in the future, our ability to look at workforce, kind of strategic talent flow, and everything for this position. And so um, setting that base salary up where the base salary is the lion's share of the attention, is the lion's share of the flag that we use to attract candidates and to retain the talent we have with the regular incentive pay being a portion and the long term being a much smaller contributor because I don't think that's really what will drive our ability to recruit and retain the kind of talent we need and the kind of comprehensive talent that we need with health care, with pension, with all the factors we've talked about for this position versus peers, I don't think we want to have our base salary offers slipping below that median. I would be, I would want to see them at or well above median. And I will add that, um, I don't know if we mentioned this or anybody mentioned this earlier, but we have um, our CEO is constantly at the Capitol talking to our legislators and our governor. Our CEO is putting out fires, PR fires all the time. So she's also our head PR person. So um, and we are the fund that attracts the most media. So I think that's important to consider, too, when we consider her compensation. And Ms. Pascal. Rogers. Madam Chair, I'd like to uh, move option B. I will second that. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I just want so I have option B moved. Anybody want to make a second? I'll second it. Do you need it read out? Anybody need it read out? Are we good? Like? Option B. Like uh, so we have a, a motion by Pascal Rogers, second by Middleton. Thank you. Hold on one second. Oh, turn it back on. I clicked it. Let's try it. There oh, there go. it went. Uh, what is the base salary that you're recommending? Are we doing that today, or are we doing are we doing range? for to be decided I, I, I maybe I'm confused so we're we're deciding today the range right and then are we also deciding uh, uh, what would I thought so we Doug can do you tell us what she currently July. base is making so we can determine where sure. our base starts uh, so the current range is identified on this slide or one previous and then um, Current compensation is three hundred and forty three thousand nine hundred and forty nine dollars. So she's at three forty three, which it's is top of the range, right? It's like nine thousand dollars from the top. But yes. Yeah. Okay. So would the maker of the motion accept that uh, the base salary should be not less than the midpoint of five hundred and three thousand? Yes. yes. Okay. Or so more. the motion from Ms. Pascal Rogers is option B with the base salary not being less than the midpoint of 
437 or 503? 503. 503, the midpoint. With uh, of the new range with uh, flex, uh, bringing this recommendation back to us in December with a final uh, figure that uh, we would base, but it would not be less than 503. Uh, you can make a friendly can amendment. Can I ask a clarifying question? Yeah. Let's start that again. Okay, okay, so go ahead. So as I'm understanding the motion, so tell me if I have it wrong. The motion would be option B and the actual salary of the CEO on July 1 would be the midpoint of the new range, which is stated here as 503. Not less than the midpoint. Right. So I'd, I would like to well, leave open that uh, we... We, sh we would have to make that decision. So today. we can't ask them to bring that back. We would have to make that decision. Then I think we need to be closer to 75% uh, as opposed to a 50% yeah. midpoint. Yeah. So I need a number. Uh, can somebody give me what 75% we, okay. would be? Ms. Pascal Rogers, could you withdraw and restate? I withdraw. Okay. Okay. Ms. Oliveras. Oops, hold on. Ready? Go ahead. Okay, so a couple things. First, I want to say that I do not think option B is an adequate range. Just given... The base salaries of other California CEOs of other base, California based agencies, UC system, and the complexity of the role. And I actually think that the base salary range should be up to 750, and I would like us to sit, be around 75% of that. This is so are you saying the high point is 750? Potentially, yes, and that's why I want to ask the consultant about that, too. I mean, is that reasonable from what you've seen, given the complexity of this role and how there aren't a lot of comparables? Yeah, you know, we would support a, a higher range. Um, one of the things, though, just, you know, looking, we developed this based upon, you know, the peer group that you guys had approved originally, and so while there might be some individual organizations who might pay more or less, um, we base this upon your kind of combined peer group that includes public funds as well as private institutions so um, I would hesitant to base upon base a range just on a handful of organizations uh, but more looking at the more broad peer group that the board had approved previously okay uh, Ms. Ortega uh, I, I just want to state for the board members and the record I would support one of the changes that is proposed in the Grant Thornton memo I think they're based on a good analysis we have all the information necessary to think about comparisons and the kinds of issues that are raised if we start coming up on the fly with different outside boundaries and based on information we found on the internet in the last 15 minutes um, I will not support the motion at that point okay and Mr. Fechner. I guess I'm just confused when I hear Ms. Olivero say that you know, it puts us behind everyone. 503 is higher than everybody on this list except one. No, we're talking about UC Davis, or UC Regents. But not who's, not who's on this list, right? Lissera is, right isn't updated on here. And then also um, Sacramento Utility, Municipal it's Utility lower. District. It's 550 now. Oh, it's a, it's a not number that's not featured. Yeah. I'm sorry, say that again, Ms. Oliver. And then Sacramento Municipal Utility District, that range is 427 to 650. Right, that's one. Uh, yeah, Lacerra is 550. Well, not on here, but okay. No, it's, yeah. I hear you. But um, it's and higher than everything else on this are list. are far now. more limited, right? So we do have health insurance. We do have long-term care insurance and a lot of exposure. So I am kind of on the on the page because we have the option of getting her up to 786 with option a 774 with option b um we can adopt a midpoint and stay stay adopt the midpoint so we're starting high because if you think about it if her her base salary starts at 503 that's higher than uh, mr ailman's base salary and now we don't end up higher. Now it should be, huh? Yeah, yeah. Jack Ains. Jack Ains. Uh, I'm sorry, Jack Ains. Um, it should be higher. It should be far higher, given the complexity of this job compared to that. At sure. Masters. So, but then the other issue is, and maybe we should ask Grant Thornton, 
if we stay the salary in the uh, option B that Mona originally mentioned at the midpoint, do we then do the uh, salary target of 27% or do we ask to move option A's salary, annual incentive salary target down to option B? And that was something that we discussed internally um, when putting this together. And if you were to do that, the maximum opportunity um, would be about 1.2 million around there. Um, so it'd be kind of directly in between the 50th and 75th percentile. Okay. Yeah. So if we moved, I need to get closer to the mic. If we moved option A's annual incentive of 40, uh, target salary of 40% instead of 27% down to option B, then we're at what, 1.2 million? Yeah, for the maximum. For the maximum, 1.2 yeah. million. I don't remember the, the target off the top of my head, but I do remember the maximum would be directly between the 50th and 75th percentile of the market. And then do we leave, is that also uh, changing the long-term incentive to the 40% as well? That would, okay. correct. And the maximum annual incentive opportunity of 60%. Okay. And so, are, are we still looking at mid-range or are we looking at 75th percentile? So we're looking at mid-range of option cool. B, 503, but then at the very top of the uh, salary target of 40% and long-term incentive at 40%, she could make $1.2 million. And, and, and we're not saying that's where that's going to go. But we're saying that that's... That could be where it could go. And to clarify, too, that midpoint of 503000 is targeting the 75th percentile of the market for base salary. Okay. That that's is targeting. A, that's what I was going to ask. Okay. Yeah. 75th percentile. Okay. And now I've got a couple more questions, and that is uh, Matt. Go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just want to make sure that I'm cl understanding clear what's being proposed, at least I guess in the motion, is the iteration of option B that's being suggested that the, the the range of the salary, is the bottom of it is 503, and that's the new starting point. But it goes or no is, higher than 628. Well, I, I can see that. I'm just asking if the range no longer 377 to 628. We would recommend the range being 377 to 628 with that midpoint of the range targeting the second. Okay, well, I guess maybe I'm, I should ask <clears throat> the person who is making the motion, is that correct or not? I pulled mine. It's hers, isn't it? I don't know who's. We don't have a motion on the table, we, guys. We don't okay. have a motion at this point. Okay. Yeah. Thank, thank you. For so we're just still discussing this right okay. now. Okay. Just making sure. I, I know there was a, a motion previously. So. Okay. So can I have a motion for what we just talked about? Move. Hold on. I need oh. your. Oh, you turned it on for me? You're so awesome. Thank you. <laughs> Go ahead. Madam Chair, I would like to, to move uh, for option B with the, the salary being no less than of 503, of replacing the, el the long-term 27% uh, to 40%. And the annual incentive? And the annual incentive? 27 to 40%? Yes. Okay. Do I or have no, it's zero to 40 because your target, you have, it's zero to 40. Right. That's what you But we're replacing it from the zero to 20, um, target of 27%. So we're going, we're taking option A's, if this is what I'm hearing from you for your um, motion, option mm -hmm. A's annual incentive of zero to 60 target of 40 and moving it down to option B and replacing that one. No. No? I was, I was actually, I said the long-term uh, target instead of 27 to 40, but keeping, keeping the zero to 40 for the annual incentive. Okay, so then we won't get to 1.2 mil. Is that where you want it to be? That's fine with me. I just need to know. I, I'm open for discussion, but that's what I'm proposing. Okay, so let me get this right. So we have a motion for the salary, uh, the 75th percentile of option B, 377 to 628, no, starting at no less than 503. Annual incentive of 0 to 40% target rate of 27%. Long-term incentive, incentive paid 27% uh, moving that up to 40%. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. Do I have a second for that? I do not have a second for that. Okay. Motion dies. 
We have to gotta, we have to get, make a decision here, guys. No, I know. I would just think. And one thing I'll mention on that, um, if you were to go that route, right. that would be a different long-term incentive structure than everybody else who's participating in the long-term incentive program. So currently how the structure was designed for the uh, incentive off or invent, sorry, the investment office, the target was going to be equal to the annual incentive target, but it could be less if actual payment was less. So, I'd, I would so it should be, I would suggest keeping that a similar, um, process. Okay. Do I have another motion? Oh, Hey, number three, which is Mr. Miller. Uh, I would just again kind of reiterate that I would de-emphasize rather than increase the the exposure to that long-term incentive by leaving it kind of as it is in B and put your emphasis on increasing the salary. And if you wanted to even think about it instead of in just terms of nominal figures, think about it as encompassing from the 50th up through and into the 75th percentile ranges or something like that rather than just tossing out numbers and focus on increasing the salary range and if you wanted to increase anything else the annual incentive rather than the long-term incentive so unfortunately i think the problem is is we'd have to ask for an, another review because we have you're talking about 75th percentile inclusive of stuff that we haven't got on our figures here as i understand it is that correct that is and you know that option b again we're we're targeting the 75th percentile um somebody in that you know depending on the individual they could be in the lower end or the higher end of that range um, so it's possible that somebody could get paid more than the 75th percentile in the market because the range goes up to six hundred and twenty-eight thousand dollars. um if you were to add in kind of combine what i'm hearing is the midpoint of 503 which targets the 75th percentile and then increase the incentives that the um, current structure is today to zero to 60 for annual and 40 percent for long-term incentive that would get a maximum opportunity between the 50th and 75th percentile directly between directly between yes. okay now i've got uh number 12. lisa all right <clears throat> My concern with the motion, as Ms. Pascual Rogers made it, is it still seemed it put too much in the incentive and not enough in the base salary. So, and I, I'm doing my math roughly, but I think the 75th percentile of this 377, 250 to 628, 750 comes out somewhere in the range of 560 to 570 thousand dollars. Okay. I and again my math was was rough, but uh <clears throat> assuming that we started with a base salary there, if we using option B kept the annual incentive and the long term incentive uh at twenty seven percent, then I I think we would end up with uh something that was primarily base salary and would still provide an opportunity uh, starting at in the $560,000 range to get close to a million dollars by uh, if everything was achieved. The only problem is, is we're closer to the top. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's the only problem. Go and ahead. One thing I'll mention, uh, our current recommendation of option B, on the, while the target is at seven, $775,000, um, the maximum opportunity is a little over a million that we currently have on here as our At the 27%? Yes, if you, if you it, as, as written here, in our recommendation of option B, the maximum opportunity for this position and the structure would be $1.05 million. Okay, so if we start, so, so then I'm gonna take this as a motion, Ms. Middleton, of 500 and, Seventy thousand dollars. Okay. Uh, and option B at seventy-five percentile. You're taking seventy-five percent between the three seventy-seven and six twenty-eight, mm -hmm. right? Which is the five seventy. Um, and leaving the annual incentive target. Uh, annual incentive is zero to forty. Target twenty-seven. Long-term incentive lower of actual annual incentive paid twenty-seven percent of salary. Again. And we're going to leave it there. Okay, I need a second on that motion. A second. Okay, so I have the motion made by Ms. Middleton, second by Ms. Pascal Rogers. Looks like I have people who want to talk. So hold on. We have discussion before we'll take a vote. 
Number 15 is Ms. Paquin. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, before this motion was made, I was actually going to speak out in support of um, Mona's um, move. Uh, resolution. I was getting too late. <laughs> That's what you said. Um, I agree. This is a very complex organization. We have a great CEO. She does a great job. I think our only concern is that we have compensation policies, and we've just gone through a process of setting compensation-based salaries, incentives, long-term incentives for the investment office for many of the executive positions, and we set those at the midpoint. We set the annual incentive and the long-term incentive, and I think that this sets a different precedent, and I'm not sure that we want to go down this road. And it might be better to just stick with one of the options as presented by the compensation consultant. And I think that that also speaks to some of the concerns that Arena was expressing earlier as well, too. Thank and you. The, and I agree. And the only thing I will say is that managing directors make 506 at midpoint. So. <laughs> Can I, that, can I kind of respond to that? So we do have in the agenda item, so there's been sort of several things that, that you've, I think Ms. Uh, Paquin just mentioned. So for the CIO, we paid at the 75th. The CFO is the 50th, and that's just base. And then from a total cash, slightly above 50th or between 50th and 75th. So we're kind of in that space right now. Um, some of the investment positions, again, between the 50th and 75th, same thing on, on total cash um, side. So I think we're kind of in that band. I don't think we're outside of it at the moment, so. Okay. Yeah, and that's um, page two of three in the agenda item background. All of those have been essentially done in the last, between June 2018 and, and basically September of, of 2019, those changes have been made, so. So would you say this is our kind of our philosophy at this point, it, that we it, should be moving sure in this direction like with the CEO and the CIO? And as I mean, we the CEO. And as we develop these recommendations, we had that in mind, too, of, you know, the company's the organization's philosophy today is to target between the 50th and 75th percentile of total comp to market total cash. And so we modeled that with these recommendations, as well as compared it internally with the same structure as well. Okay, for great. The positions that Mr. Hoffner has mentioned. Mr. Perez. Uh, I was just going to suggest, I, I don't know that you have to come to a decision today. Uh, this is kind of a big deal for all parties involved. And we're we not can meeting kick it, again for months, are we? But this isn't going to take effect until July 1. So we can kick it back to them and, and ask for, you know, like legit research. This was legit research. Not this. The, the you know, me looking up all the other info. Not, I'm not, I'm not punking you. But I'm, you know what I'm saying. It sounds like it, man. No, 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 no. no. I'm saying the, uh, the internet searches that we did up here. Yeah, so just to be clear, we followed the peer comparator group that was in the board's policy. So the additional questions are fine, but what we did and have done for all of these positions, both McGloggan and Grant Thornton, has looked at what the board has adopted in terms of its overall peer comparator group for both the investment office and executive positions. So um, adding additional perspectives this is where the California based agencies came in about two years ago was based upon your feedback. If you'd like right. to add others or remove some, that's we're fine with all that. We just want to make sure we're, you know, comparing based upon the policy that's been adopted. And I, and I will say just one other thing. Um, we have two women in all of this that we're comparing with. It would sure be nice to actually get a woman into the 75th percentile. I don't know what that other woman makes, but I know we're not there. <laughs> so, Ms. Ortega. Can I get a clarification on the, um, on option B, the the 503,000 is the mid point between the range, right? Correct. Um, what is the 50th percentile? Is it, it's not the, is that number in this table on the salary only? Yeah, so the 50th percentile of the market data is 437,000. Okay. So it's option A. Yeah, and the 75th percentile, the market data was 503. And one thing, too, to kind of clarify as well is today's recommendation is really just on the structure and the range, yeah. not necessarily the individual in the role. That would yeah. be a, a later discussion. Yeah. So um, I want to op offer a substitute motion of option B, setting the salary effective July 1 at the midpoint of 503, because setting the salaries at the midpoint of the range is a pretty common state practice, and I feel like it would be more consistent with the way we treat public employees. Okay, I need a second for that. We didn't catch that. You want to say that louder? Sure. It's a substitute <laughs> motion for option B, setting the salary effective July 1 at the midpoint of the range, which is 503. 
$503,000. Everything else stays the same? Everything else, the... Yes. Okay, the annual incentive, a long-term incentive Under also. what's under, uh, under B, yeah. Under B. B, okay. Second. Okay, I have, and this is a substitute motion, so we're voting on the substitute motion. I have two people that want to talk first. Ms. Oliveris. Earlier you mentioned that STRS is reevaluating the uh, base salary for their CEO. Right now their base his base salary is 479. I would anticipate that that base salary is only going to increase. I'm concerned that if we set the midpoint right now that we might have to renegotiate salary a year later. What are your thoughts on that? I think that's one of the reasons why we suggest having a range and targeting, let's say, the midpoint at the 75th percentile. Um, there are going to be people who may make more. Not, not you know, and we can discuss the individuals in the role, but there's going to be a room in that range to to move somebody within that range. And um, when you look at individuals and trying to, one of the, the issues with comparing one individual's pay with another other individual is there's different. It could be different mechanics involved. Um, I would suggest looking at the range of what you could pay, what the role is worth or the role is, um, you know, is competitive at. <clears throat> that's why we're suggesting paying at the 75th percentile midpoint with the ability to earn more than the 75th percentile in, in base salary. Um, getting some incentives in there to kind of target between the 50th and 75th percentile as well. So to answer your question, there is room within a range um, that somebody could make more than the midpoint. Um, could somebody in another organization get paid more? I guess that that's possible, but I would I would caution to not base your range just upon one individual or one data point in the marketplace. Of course, I understand. I, I also recall that you said that the incentive range for nine, for Calster CEO in 1920 is going to be zero to 115 percent, which was greater than the incentive range I see here for the Calper CEO, and in fiscal year 2021 it's going to be zero to 150 percent. Is it possible then that the, if we choose option B, for example, today, that um, the CalPERS CEO would be compensated less than the CalSTIR CEO? So I just want to input there, and then I'll let Rob. Um, he's overpaid. Let's just be clear. <laughs> he is out of the range by a lot. And, and one thing is, I'll, I'll is add that to that your is, opinion as well? I, I'm not going to speak to the individual <laughs> comp of one individual. Um, but what I would say is that if you look at the maximum opportunity at what you described at Calster's um, with the 150% incentive, that comes out to 1 .1, almost $1.2 million. Mm -hmm. If you look at our option B, um, the maximum is one, 1 million. Um, with the potential, though, with that long-term incentive, you know, that money does go into... Um, you know, the initial amount would be, in this example of option B, 27% of salary. If the, mar if the targets are hit um, over the next five years, that amount could increase based upon performance. Um, that could be paid out. So there is an opportunity to get potentially more than $1.5 million in any one year if the fund <coughs> outperforms its target. So um, again, I think our recommendations are have appropriate leverage between base salary and incentives. Um, the current, you know, option C we provided where there's no long-term incentive and a high um, annual incentive while less than the CalSTRS um, annual incentive uh, ranges, it still, in our mind, puts too much emphasis on short-term performance and less on, you know, longer-term performance. So our, our recommendation would be not to have an annual incentive of that magnitude uh, for this role. I, I also want to be cognizant, if, if I could just make another comment, too. So, as we've discussed, CalPERS has a lot more complexity, many more responsibilities beyond that of CalSTRS, and I don't want to use just CalSTRS as a reference point, but I also do not want to have our CEO, who's doing far more, be paid less, and the message that sends about a CEO who's a woman, it almost sends the message that we value her less. I, I totally get what you're saying. And I think that's the wrong saying. message to send. I, and I can't, we can't, unfortunately, we can't ask our consultants to weigh in on that, um, but uh, I will. I will agree with you. But I, I, you heard what I said earlier. <laughs> Did you want to talk, Mona? No, I'm good. Okay. So then I have uh, Ms. Middleton. 
No, I was just going to say that our, you know, our ranges are designed to be competitive with the market 75th percentile. Where an individual falls in that range is up, is up to you and where you want to, where you want to place the individual. But our, we're, we're coming up with a range for the CEO position, not necessarily the pay for one individual. Okay. Ms. Middleton? You know, we're struggling to find what is the right salary, and I don't know that there is uh, an ability for us to quit to do this today today um, the most important thing that I want to see happen at the end of the day is that both our CEO and uh, uh, the community recognizes the high regard that we have for her and the work that she is doing uh, and uh, uh, that becomes the critical question in in everything that we're doing here while uh, I could support uh, higher figures we are providing a substantial increase in uh, salary and we are doing so uh, because we are trying to define uh, the value that we have in Marcy Frost and the understanding that we have of uh, the complexity of the assignment of it, that anyone holding that office will have. I agree. Ms. Pascal Rogers. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. I, I, I agree. I do not, I caution everybody to wait and to postpone because if I heard correctly and when I asked, you know, we've, people, we've, this board has postponed before and nothing has happened. And when a board does something like that, the signal that we send to the staff, to the, to, the, to the whole pension world and to other businesses is not a good one. And so I think we need to make a decision on a range today. Um, because, and then when July comes and, you know, we've got to decide, you know, you do the, we do a, an evaluation, um, performance measures, then, that you can have that conversation, but today, I think that this committee should agree upon a range so that we can move forward with the whole board. Thank you. Okay, so I have no further comments from the committee. I have a, a motion from Ms. Ortega for option B, 75th percentile at the, mid, at the midpoint starting salary at the midpoint of $503,000, leaving the annual incentive of zero to 40% target of 27%, long-term incentive lower of actual annual incentive paid uh, and 27% 20, of salary. It was seconded by Mr. Fechner. Um, for all of, can we do this on a uh, roll call? It has to be a roll call vote. Okay, I need a roll call vote. Please. Teresa Taylor. Let's start with Ms. Ortega oh, and finish um, with me. Irena Ortega. Aye. Rob Fechner. Aye. Fiona Ma. Mas oh, Matthews. sorry. Matthew Saha for Fiona Ma. Aye. Lisa Middleton. Aye. Stacey Oliveris. Aye. Mona Pascal Rogers. Aye. And Teresa Taylor. Aye. Motion passes. So that's where we're at. We're at the option B, starting salary range 503,000, keeping the annual incentive and long-term incentive of option B. Yay, we did it. <laughs> oh, we're not done yet though, are we? <clears throat> Hold on a sec. Come on. Can I clarify something? Sure. Ms. Ortega. Yeah, I just want to clarify because the way the um, the outcome of the vote was stated was slightly different than the way I stated it in the motion. So I just want to make clear that the motion was the range in option B with the salary effective July 1 at the midpoint, the 503. At, at the end, you kind of said the range was 503 to something. I, I didn't mean was, I didn't I think mean there was like some that. confusion about so that. I, so I took it as recommendation B, option yes. B, option the 377,250 to 628,750, midpoint 503 as the starting salary in July 1. Correct. Zero to 40 with a 27% target, an LTI of 27%. That was the motion. 
Okay. And it passed. So I think everybody got it. Okay. Hold on, where are we? Henry has something. Oh. I actually have Henry. Go ahead, Mr. Yeah, thank Jones. You. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just want to, uh, I'm, I'm going to be leaving now, but I just want to mention that there's no closed session in the morning. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Jones. Another 12 minutes of sleep. So at this point, we are on, I think we're done, right? So we're on 7A, which is summary of committee direction. I, I took other notes, but I think we answered those questions, and then with that motion, I think resolved any of their questions that were. Do identified. we want to still Less see that information? So apparently, so. Stacy. St so which information? Let's be specific. The total compensation data for the Canadian and U.S. pension plans, and see where we fit in with that range. For the U.C. regions, I want the base, and I want all incentive. Um, and then more detail, too, on what we were saying for the chancellors as well. And LaSara, that information is available. Thank you. All right, so, and Mr. Yeah. Uh, Miller, go ahead. I just want to thank all my colleagues, particularly the folks on the committee, for taking the bull by the horns, making a decision. It's a good decision, in, in my view, maybe not the best decision, um, but, you know, that's what the future is for. And uh, I'm really glad we did this because I really felt kind of bummed out after our, the last meeting of this committee. And now I'm, I'm uh, much more uh, optimistic about uh, going forward with a more appropriate compensation plan for our CEO position. Thank you, Mr. Miller. Uh, Doug, anything else that you had for uh, direction? No, I did not. You had, okay. And do I have anybody with public comment? Does not look like it. So this meeting is adjourned. Full board will be at 9 a.m.